ever coming out. Um, the row has always been uh, something a little bit near and dear to my heart. Uh, I grew up in New England, and my parents were from Massachusetts. I grew up in a very rural era of New Hampshire. And I only read Thoreau when I was probably a senior in high school. And I'm like, wow, this is so cool. And it spoke to me on a lot of different levels. And I actually learned from that, I'm like, okay, this is where my parents get this from or that from. And uh, in that rural environment, you know, it's, it's New England's a small area. It, uh, the impressions that Thoreau made and his theories and the, the things that he imprinted on a page back in 18 whatever, uh, actually uh, are still very relevant and very alive today and I realized where some of it came from for the first time. So it was pretty cool and I love um, some of his, uh, the nature things that uh, uh, appeal to me of course, but uh, also some of the philosophical, political things. But I want to read to you, Morning bring back, Brings Back the Heroic Ages. Every morning was a cheerful invitation to make my life of equal simplicity and I may say innocence with nature herself. I have been a sincere worshiper of Aurora as the Greeks. I, go, I got up early and bathed in the pond. That was a religious exercise and one of the best things which I did. They say that characters were engraved on the bathtub of King Titan. <laughs> I can't pronounce it, uh, to this effect. Uh, renew thyself completely each day. Do it again and again and forever again. I can understand that. Morning brings back the heroic ages. I was as much affected by the faint hum of a mosquito making its invisible and unimaginable tour through my apartment at earliest dawn when I was sitting with the door and windows open as I could be by a trumpet and that as I could be by any trumpet that ever sang of fame. It was Homer's Requiem, itself an Iliad and an Odyssey, in the air singing its own wrath and wanderings. There was something cosmical about it, a standing advertisement, till forbidden, of the everlasting vigor and fertility of the world. The morning, which is the most memorable season of the day, is the awakening hour, and there is least solemnness in us, and for an hour at least, some part of us awakes which slumbers all the rest of the day and night. Little is to be expected of that day, if it can be called a day, to which we are not awakened by our genius, with a capital G, uh, but by the mechanism nudging, mechanical nudgings of some servitor are not awakened by our own newly acquired force and aspirations from within, accompanied by the undulations of celestial music instead of factory bells and a fragrance filling the air to a higher life than we fell asleep from. And thus the darkness bears its fruit and proves itself to be good no less than the light. The man who does not believe that each day contains an earlier, more sacred and auroral hour than he has yet to he has yet profaned has despaired of life in a way. After a partial cessation of his sens sensuous life, the soul of man, or its organs rather, are reinvigorated each day and his genius tries again what noble life it can make. All memorable events, I should say, transpire in the morning and time, in the morning time and in the morning atmosphere to him whose 
elastic and vigorous thought keeps pace with the sun. The day is a perpetual morning. It matters not what the clock says or the attitude and the labors of men. Morning is when I am awake and there is a dawn in me. So that's one. I don't know how we're doing on time here. I've got a couple others. Um, Live Simply and Wisely is the title of this one. Uh, I'm convinced both by faith and experience that to maintain oneself on this earth is not a hardship but a pastime if we will live simply and wisely as the pursuits of the simpler nations are still the sports of the most artificial. It is not necessary that a man should earn his living by the sweat of his brow unless he sweats easier than I do. One young man of my acquaintance who has inherited some acres told me that he thought he should live as I did if he had the means. I would not have anyone adopt my mode of living on any account for besides that before he has fairly learned it, I may have found out another way for myself. I desire that there may be as many different persons in the world as possible, but I would have each one be very careful to find out and pursue his own way, and not his father's or his big sister's or his neighbor's instead. The youth may build or plant or sail, only let him not be hindered from doing that which he tells me he would like to do. It is by a mathematical point only that we are wise as the sailor or the fugitive slave keeps the polar star in his eye, but this is sufficient guidance for all of our lives. We may not arrive at our port within calculable within a calculable period, but we would preserve the true course. So, the very interesting to me, personally, philosophies on, on nature and following one's own dreams and personality and pursuit, and I think it speaks well to the blueberry patch because that's kind of, that's kind of what the blueberry patch is all about. It's part of it's part of Dallas's philosophy. It's part of the reason that we're here. Um, it's very, very interesting. And Thoreau, um, Ian hasn't come up with that part quite yet, but uh, he was very much a botanist, naturalist, of course, back to the woods and all of that. Um, but he uh, wrote, Ian, can you hand me uh, wild fruit? And also, also my book. Yeah. Thank you. It's kind of fun looking at um, Dallas's theories and how he built the blueberry patch and all. There again, it just harkens back to all of this Thoreau influence that has been going on for generations and generations, and it's pretty cool. And in his botany phase, he uh, wrote a book that was not published until 70 years after he died. And it's basically a total botany thing and he's evaluating plants and through the different seasons. And blueberries were of particular interest to him. And it's, it's very technical, but it, it's kind of fun too. And it says, um, I forget, I think we're in springtime here. Uh, about the same time, the later second kind of low blueberry, the common low blueberry, the firm berry, which is generally found with huckleberries on a bush of the same size, begins to ripe. This is an upright slender shrub with a few long wand-like branches with green bark and crimson colored shoots and gladius green leaves. The flowers have a crimson rose tint 
of a delicate nature. They grow either on open hillsides or pastures or in sprout lands or in thin woods and are from one and a half to two feet high. And he goes on to uh, tell about his wanders out into the field and just gathering berries. And it's the same story that Dallas has in his book. You know, as a kid, I was out doing berries. Okay, that's what Thoreau was doing 150 years earlier. So that's kind of fun. And another thing that ties in how much Thoreau has um, affected our society still in this day after generations and generations and how Dallas took uh, a lot of these theories and created his own theory about it. But there's a little piece uh, called uh, Nutrition for the Soul. And it won't take me long to read it to you and then I'll stop hogging the stage. <laughs> the blueberry patch is a place to reap and a place to sow, where you're sure to find someone you'd like to know. The patch is abundant, beautiful, and giving. It's, a carpet, it's carpeted with leaves, bamboo, bougainvillea, oak, Australian pine, uh, and lychee nut. Each tree takes care of itself. By dropping its beautiful leaves, it feeds itself. Every one of the leaves on every one of the trees grows, knows that its destination is in part to grow and in part to give, to fall back and to grow again. This is our destination too. One of the ideas nurtured at the patch is industries cast off can be used in artful ways to create an environment of peace and harmony. Since art is the symbol and expression of the soul, why not do it here? The mingling of simpatico souls, just like the mingling of the leaves on the ground, is given back to Mother Earth. This place is very raw. In this state, it is most susceptible to manipulation. It has morphing capacities. It can go anywhere from here. Anything can be done with it, change it, mutate it, embellish it, enhance it, reduce it, or knead it like dough. Knead it raw. The patch nourishes in a very primal way, a way that takes no effort is like continuous automatic feed here. One does not need a special dispensation or disposition to be nourished here. If there is a need for acceptance or for a place of peacefulness, happiness, and joy, the patch is where everything is appreciated. The simplest cast-off doodad can find its own place here. All of us cast-offs or all of the non-fitting parts find a way to feel comfortable here. Satisfy your hunger for community and share with like-minded souls. The patch is a refuge for, from a world where there is not a lot of genuine interaction, where you have to guard your creativity outlook. Here you may be free to be spontaneous. Everyone can join in. There's no exclusivity. It's an all-inclusive place where all of the senses interact. There are blossoms for the nose, music for the ears, dazzling and mirrored lights for the eyes, all displayed in reverence for nature, our spiritual core. The earth nourishes all creatures in various ways. In this little patch of ground, the breeze blowing through the trees is enough to make you instantly at ease. and then, and when the breeze excites the mobiles, which were made of cast off steel, glass, or bamboo, they ring out their peace and reflect their light. Everywhere you look, all is shining and nourished by nature and by companionship. We may all feel acceptance among all of the other cast offs. There's a little bit more to it, but I thought it really speaks to how Dallas had taken uh, Thoreau's thoughts and initiatives and philosophy and put them into real life here at the Patch. So.
that's my thoughts. <laughs> Thank you.